It'll take a little while for us to understand how time works, but I pray that even this evening you'll have a little bit more of an understanding of how time works, okay? This is the timeline we're used to, okay? Uh, that's a cross, right? Usually there's an arc over here somewhere, all right? And then usually, this is the part I really don't like. There's this right here. And then there's a big arrow saying, you are right here. Well, I got a problem with that. <laughs> because, you know, if we were here, <clears throat> we'd kind of know what's going on. But we happen to be smack dab in the middle of this unknown. And as a result of this, I mean, this is funny, but this is a reality in the body of Messiah. The body of Messiah... Basically, everyone says, well, Yeshua's coming. They've been saying Yeshua's coming. People thought it was 2000, and that Y2K never happened, so now, it, now they're thinking it's something else. It's always something else. I remember listening to Prince, and now we're at a party like it's 1999. And I thought to myself, wow, 1999. Wow, what will that be like? Now when I say that, I'm embarrassed because people are saying, 1999? That's like the 1900s, man. Like, how old are you? <laughs> so, uh, so it's a real tough situation. So anyway, we're smack dab in the middle of this time right there, which is the unknown. This is really detrimental, and I'll tell you why. If you take someone and you sentence them to prison, let's say you're going to have them in there for one week. But you don't tell them it's one week. You just put them in prison. Okay? They don't know how long they're going to be here. If they're waiting day after day after day without the unknown, they might hang themselves because they, it's an unknown. They're in there and every day is an eternity for them. They don't know if they're there forever. They don't know if they're there just for a short period. They don't know. So when you don't know, you feel discouraged. You take another man and you say, you're going to be in prison for 10 years, and the man who's going to be there for 10 years knows. He can begin to mark on the wall. He says, you know it's going to be a long time, but, it's, but at, at the end of 10 years, I'm out of here. Even though he has a much longer sentence, he can endure a longer sentence because he knows what's coming. The man who's in there for a week and he does not know that whole week of time is an eternity for him, and it's very discouraging. The body of Messiah is set on an unknown right now. And it is, they're so discouraged. So discouraged. All you got to do is run into a believer who, who used to be on fire for God like 20 years ago. And, and, and then you go to them and say, man, Jesus is coming soon. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, whatever. I, you know, he was coming soon 20 years ago too. You know, and, and, and that unknown leaves people. It, it, it opens the door for the enemy to mess with people's faith in their mind. So my prayer tonight is that you will shift from this unknown into a solid understanding of how God's calendar works. Because when you understand his calendar, you realize this is not how his calendar works. You'll throw away all the charts you have. And you begin to rejoice and say, oh my God, that's it? That simple? That simple. This is not God's calendar because God is not a linear God. Everything God does is found right down to the smallest thing that he has created. Right down to the atom, the nucleus of the atom, to the, to the galaxies and to the heavens. Everything in the universe operates exactly the same way. Circles. 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 Everything. Everything. If you had a square here and you brought it down to the smallest thing, you'd realize the square is made up of circles. God's time is not linear. God's time is a circle. This is why it's beautiful. You can never miss anything. Because if you don't catch it here, just stick around. Next year, at this time, it's coming again. And it's eternal, forward, and backwards at the same time. You'll catch it. 
If, if you exist at some point, you will catch the flow of God. You don't get left somewhere. You'll catch up to it. Or it will catch up to you. You see, this is not an unknown with a question mark. On this time of circles, we can now begin to place the festivals of the Lord. Okay? So, we're going to go ahead and do that on this little chart. And let's say that this is the first month, okay, of God's calendar, as it makes a big circle. Okay, on Nisan, first month, um, I'm going to put a little cross because I think we know that is Passover that Messiah was crucified, okay? We, we know that, right? So, there it is in his calendar, okay? Um, this is seven days after Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, I'll put two little squares here. Oh, this is two pieces of matzah, okay? One, two, okay? Seven weeks after this, probably somewhere over here, okay? We have the Feast of Weeks, which is known in the church as Pentecost, okay? Um, coming down to about right here somewhere, half of the year, seventh month, make sense? Seventh month is a little past half of the year, okay? So if this is one, think of this as, as a clock. If this is one, two, three, four, five, six would be down here or something like that. Seven, probably somewhere over here. Okay. Feast of Trumpets. Okay. Coming around, uh, Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month. Ten days later is the Day of Atonement. Little tears over here. Okay. Uh, Fifteen days after this, probably over here, we have the Feast of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. You see it? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six festivals in God's time schedule. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pretty simple? Okay. So, when you're done fe celebrating the festivals of the Lord, as spring comes, you know, when, when, when life begins to come and devour death, because all winter everything is kind of dead, you know what I mean, and nothing can grow, suddenly spring comes and devours death, there is the resurrection, that, you know, coming up. So, so God's count, it's like every year God says, okay, let's do this again. Let's do this again. And he brings us to another level of understanding. But it's not a linear time. It's like, okay, I've done this before. Now I'm doing it again, and I'm gaining more understanding of the things of God. Now I'm doing it again, I'm getting more understanding of the things of God. A constant circle, year after year after year. Okay? Good me so far? Okay, so if this is one year, okay, this would be the next year. Pretty simple, right? Because time in God's understanding is not a line, so it stays in a circle. Every year you just repeat it over and over and over again. You don't miss anything, okay? And then this is another <coughs> year, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. <coughs> and every single one of these years, in this window of time, God's people are celebrating Passover. God is here today, yesterday, and forever celebrating 
at the same moment that the Messiah is being placed on the cross, at the same moment he's over here with the children of Israel in Egypt about getting them set to be free. And he's watching both events as if it's one event. So throughout our generations, whether you are the generation in Egypt or whether you are the generation 2,000 years ago watching the Messiah being put on a cross or whether you're the generation 2,000 years later now beginning to understand how God's come to work. It doesn't matter where you are in God's time. At that window of time, God comes and He meets with us and He opens up like a portal of time where He's literally with our forefathers, He's with us, and He's with our great-great-great-grandchildren. All the generations who are celebrating on this window of time his appointed festival. I know it's deep. Hang in there. Because I'm going to prove it to you in Scripture. God, I use Scripture. That rabbi never talks about Scripture. I brought my Bible for a reason. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So, so, so kind of grasping it? Kind of grasping it? Let's go, let's go to the Scriptures and... Prove this this very point, okay? Um, Lord, and I thank you for your love, Father. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Okay. If someone can open uh, John twelve, verse one, and you can read. It. Oh, no one brought their Bible. Oh, no, you did not. Oh, you're a Bible reading people. That's good. That's good. Don't get used to it. <laughs> Pretty soon, there'll be no need for it. I'm telling you, God's promises is sure. He's raising this thing up inside of us. Okay, so can someone please read John 12, verse 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Stop. Did anybody catch something about days and something? Six days before Passover. Question. If we don't know God's calendar, what does six days before Passover mean to any of us? This is one of those things you skip over and say, I just want to get to the story. Six days before Passover, who cares? I don't, under, I don't even know what calendar that's on. Well, we're going to do the calendar right now so you can see exactly what six days before Passover is. Please keep your finger on that verse because we're going to come back to it. Okay? So I'm, get, I'm just going to draw the days of the Passover month up here. Okay? So it starts with day number one. That's pretty simple. Huh? One to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, uh, 14, 15, 16, I just got to 17, we don't need to go any further, okay, anybody know uh, what day Passover is? Does anybody know what day Passover is? <laughs> Okay, you'll find it in, in Leviticus. It says on the, on the 14th day of the month, you will celebrate the festival of Passover. Okay? All right, so Passover happens on this. By the way, I'll be cool, because I don't really have time to go through all the scripture to prove the days and the times. But you can do that at home. I mean, we're in the information highway time. Go and Google what time of the month is Passover. You'll, you'll get it. And where do I find that in the Bible? You'll get it, okay? It's in Leviticus. Uh, 23, and you can also go into the Exodus where, where the Lord said, you know, on the 14th, this is going to be the Passover, okay? So, so this month over here, okay, is showing us, uh, going back to what you read. read. Read it again, please. Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Stop. When can we get to the story? Well, we got to find out what six days before Passover is, okay? Six days before Passover, okay, this is Passover, so that's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? This is kind of neat. 
So right now when it says six days before Passover, <clears throat> okay, to someone who understands God's calendar, that means on the ninth day of the first month of the biblical calendar. Are you with me? And if you're not, just say, what? I don't get it. And I'll explain it again. Okay? So if Passover is on the 14th of the first month, and the scriptures say, by the way, this was written by another Jew, and a lot of Jews who wrote the book, you know what I'm saying? Oh, it is a Jewish book. Okay. So anyway. <laughs> so, all right. So, so, so a Jew, a Jew who reads that, understands that's the ninth day. But a Gentile who doesn't understand anything about God's a point of time. That's just a date that means absolutely nothing to them. Six days before Passover. whoop de doo Okay. Well, here it is. Six days before Passover is the ninth of the month of the biblical month. Okay. All right. We don't have much time, so I'm going to go to the next scripture that tells you a next a, a next appointed uh, time. Okay. So if you go down to, no, you know what? Read it from the beginning. It's only 12, 12 verses. Yeah, twelve one, and read it to verse twelve. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover. Stop. Just kidding. No, you <laughs> came to Bethany, where Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with them. Mary then took a pound of <clears throat> very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intended to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Yes, stop, stop right there. This is what happens to us when we're reading the scripture. The most significant thing under what we're explaining here was six days before, before Passover. But there's a whole bunch of really juicy story. And we forget that God gave us a time for a reason. And we just get engrossed in the story. You know, Mary comes and, and we re recognize with her. She's, she's washing his feet with, with the perfume. And, and Judas is a traitor. So we get engrossed with a story. But we miss these, that every single thing that has been placed in the book is significant. Okay? So we're going to skip to verse 12 because there's, we are familiar with the juicy parts of the story. What we're not familiar is the calendar part of the story. Fair to say? So let's jump to back to where we get to the calendar part of the story. So this happened on the ninth day. The ninth day of the first month. Okay? Um, go ahead and go to uh, uh, verse 12. On the next day, the large crowd... Was Stop. Now we have more information. The next day. So if he did this on the ninth, what's the next day? The tenth. Wow, this is a good class. I like that. <laughs> okay. So on the 10th day, on the 10th day, are you with me? We're not messing up math here. This is simple math, right? On the 10th day, the next day, okay? Continue reading so we can know what's happening. Okay. Let's see. Okay, on the next day, the large crowd would come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, stop right there. More juicy stuff. We're familiar with that. The triumphant what? Entry. We're paying no attention to the calendar because we're excited that a prostitute washed his feet and he's entering and Hosanna, Hosanna. And then some Jews said, shut him up. And he said, if they shut up, then the rocks will praise me. And you read them, you're like, praise God, the rocks will praise him. And you're missing these little clues that God is giving us in his word, giving us exactly the moment in time when these events took place. Have you ever asked yourself, how is it that the children of Israel accepted Yeshua as a king on the 10th, and by the 14th, they killed him. Have you ever wondered that? 
Have you ever said to yourself, oh, what the hell's the matter with these people? These stiff-necked Jews. Man, if I was back then, I would have never, I would have never. Oh my God, thank God that you're not back there because you would have been the generation who would have rejected him. God is orchestrating a play. He's got a bunch of actors and he just throws you in where he needs to fill in the gaps of the story and he manifests what he wants to manifest with a generation as he wants to do it. Amen. When you realize that alone, you begin to give people a lot of breaks and say, you know what, I don't know why you don't understand God. Maybe God created not to know him so that he can show you his mercy. I don't know. I don't know why you are the way you are. Okay? So, ninth day, prostitute washes his feet. Tenth day, he is received into the house of Israel. And we know he was crucified on the 14th, Passover. Okay? Now let's get back to God's calendar time here. Okay? If this is Passover, what day is that? 14th. I'm quick to, to help out here, you know? Okay, so this is the 14th. Can you see it? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. This is the 14th. Therefore, one, two, three, four days before that, on the 10th, On the 10th, on this particular year, the children of Israel with branches welcomed Yeshua into the city. Do you want to find out what's going on in God's calendar all the way back down to Egypt? Let's go and find out. Um, can you please go to Exodus 12? Exodus 12, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the, this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. I'm freaking out! <laughs> Did you catch a date there? Yes. Yeah. We're talking about what month, which month are we in? In, 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 the, in, the, in Exodus there? This month shall be for you the first month. The first month, month of Nisan. Okay? And on what day of the month you're supposed to do something? It's verse 3. The 10th. Oh, oh, oh. So, over here, in Exodus, on the 10th day of the month, the children of Israel had to do what? Uh, take a lamb. Take a lamb into what? Their home, into the house. Into their home. Right. For four days... They were to take a lamb and actually treat it like a pet. And it was God's way of saying, I, w I don't want you to grab a lamb that you don't know. I want you to take a lamb into your home so you get familiar with this lamb. So your children get familiar with this lamb. So you get attached to the lamb. When the children of Israel, according to John, received Yeshua into the house, they were doing exactly what they did in the ancient times because in God's window of time, God saw the children of Israel, according to the commandment, bring a lamb into the house as the Lamb of God was walking into Jerusalem and they were saying, Behold, behold the King, the King, the King, the King, Hosanna to the King. They were receiving the Lamb into Jerusalem at the same time that the children of Israel were commanded, Bring a Lamb into your house and take good care of it. You with me so far? God, in the windows of time, was seeing the children of Israel in Egypt bringing in a little lamb at the same time that he's watching himself walking into Jerusalem and being received. And now he began to understand, well, how could these Jews accept him four days before they killed him? I don't get it. 
you will get it in a, in a few moments because you can't mess with God's plans. You know what? If the children of Israel would have understood that that was the Messiah, that would be no salvation for us today because if they didn't reject Him, right. if they would have made Him king, right. there would be no salvation for anybody. Amen. Not even the Jews. Right. Because He needed to lay down His life. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Okay. So, triumphant entry happened exactly at the same moment that the children of Israel received the lamb into their homes in Egypt. In Egypt. Okay? Tenth day of the first month in Egypt. Tenth day of the first month in John. Uh, go ahead and read verse uh, 6. Exodus 12, verse 6. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Stop right there. Stop right there. You shall keep it until what? 14th day. day of the same month. Okay. Who's telling them to do this stuff? Okay, so God says, bring the thing into the house, take care of it. And on the 14th, kill it. Read it again. Okay. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Okay, wait a minute. Then who who has to kill it? Congregation of Israel. Who has to kill it? Read it again. The twilight. Okay, okay. So, the twilight of this day, who has to kill them? <laughs> who has to kill them? The whole, the whole assembly. assembly. Right. The nation... Of Israel, we're going to just go ahead and put a little cross over here. I mean, a little uh, Star of David over here. So God is instructing Israel, bring the lamb into the house, and on the 14th, kill it. In God's window of time, exactly on the 14th, many years later, there was Yeshua, and Pilate said, I see no wrong in this man. And the community of Israel said, Crucify him. They were fulfilling God's commandment exactly as God commanded in Egypt when God said, and all of the Jews must kill this thing. He didn't say, and the Gentiles will kill it. He didn't say, and then see if someone won't like it and put it on a cross. He said, all the community of Israel must slay the lamb. What the children of Israel did 2,000 years ago without any knowledge was obey God's commandment given in the Torah, perfectly, so that we could be saved. At the very moment, do you remember, you know, after we're, 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 we're not going to read anymore. We've read enough. Because I can't even flow and wait and all that. At the same very moment, at the same very moment, because you understand Passover, okay? They killed the lamb on the 14th, okay? Yeshua was killed on the 14th. Okay? Once they killed the lamb, the children of Israel in Egypt, what were they supposed to do with the lamb? Spread it over the doorpost of their house. What did the children of Israel many years later on Calvary say to Pilate when he said, I see no blemish in this man? They said, Take his blood and place it over us and over our. Children, in their hate, they were suckering themselves into salvation because the only way to be saved is by being sprinkled by the blood of the Lamb. They were asking the blood of the Lamb to be placed on them at the same moment that God said, take the blood and put it on the doorpost of your house so that the angel of death will pass over your house and will not come and destroy you. That's why as a descendant of the children of Israel, it was their prayer that has allowed me to be here as one of their descendants filled with the glory of God and filled with His Spirit and by the blood of the Lamb. And all this happened at the same moment in God's time as he's seeing the future, the past, and the present in one window. On the 14th, on the 10th day of the month, bring the lamb in the house. Yeshua's walking into the city, being received as king. On the 14th, kill him. 
Before the 14th, you need to, the land has to be inspected to see if there's no blemish. Mm. Pilate is inspecting this thing. He says there's no blemish in him. Wow. Oh. Uh -huh. Pilate grabs a little thing of water and washes his hands. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's washing his hands. He has to wash his hands because the Torah says that once a priest goes and inspects the matter, he has to wash his hands. It's all connected to Torah. It had to happen this way. He had to wash his hands before the sacrifice was passed over. They said, which one will you choose? There's Barabbas. He's a sinner. And then there's this guy who didn't know any sin. Of course Barabbas has to be freed. That is the only way that he came so that Barabbas could be free. They can't pick Barabbas over him. You take him. Now there's a little dilemma. I'm going to share a little bit of thing. There, when Yeshua is on, on earth, there's a little dilemma. There is the dilemma of the priesthood because God honors the high priestly hood. And there's actually three priests on earth at this point in time. Okay? The priest who was supposed to be the anointed high priest was the son of Zacharias, which would have been Yohanan, John the Baptist. The Baptist. So spiritually, John the Baptist was the spiritual high priest. Caiaphas was the legal high priest. He was not a spiritual man. He was with the Sanhedrin. He was kind of part of like, he, he was kind of like a, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> I can't, can't talk. Ah, God help me. Okay? Uh, he, was he was a political high priest. He wasn't a spiritual high priest. But God honors the priesthood. Okay? And so Yeshua, first of all, uh, uh, God has to demote the first high priest, which is the spiritual high priest, because the true high priest is walking on the scene, which is Yeshua. Jesus himself, okay? The real high priest would have been John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away this in the world. This is a high priest saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even tie your sandals. I'm, you're the one. So this high priest, the spiritual high priest, was placing the spiritual mantle of high priesthood on Yeshua by saying, It isn't me. I must decrease that he may increase. So he was placing on Yeshua the spiritual priesthood. But there's another problem. There's another high priest, the legal one. God needs to, to demote because those have to go down so that his high priest himself can rise up. So John the Baptist, after John the Baptist says, that's the one, I've been preaching about this guy. Immediately he has to go into prison. Why? He needs to lose his head. Why? Because he can't have his priestly head. He's about to receive a new head, the head of Messiah. So he's losing his own. It's like his anointing, everything is gone because God is coming with a new thing. So he's gone. He's demoted. He's gone. There's no more spiritual high priest except for Yeshua. But there's a legal high priest, which is Caiaphas. So they bring Yeshua before Caiaphas, and Caiaphas begins to speak with him. And Caiaphas says, I adjure you by the living God. By the way, that's in Torah, and Torah it says that if a leader tells you, I adjure you by the living God, you must speak. Remember how Yeshua wasn't talking at all? He wasn't talking, he was silent, 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 silent. And all of a sudden he spoke. Everyone knows, why, why, why did he speak? He, he was silent, why did he suddenly speak? Because according to Torah, when, when the leader of the people of Israel said, I say, adjure you in the name of the Lord, you have to speak. So he had to speak. And he said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sit at the right hand of the Father, coming in glory with his angels, right? And when he said that, Caiaphas was so upset that he took his garments and he rent his garments open according to the Torah. When a high priest rips his garments, he demotes himself. So at that very moment, Caiaphas had to rip his garments because Yeshua had to be promoted not only to the legal high priest, but the spiritual high priest as well. At that point, they take and they take a, 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 a mantle and they put it over him to mock him. And they put a crown over his head. They had to put a crown over his head because God is doing a unique spiritual thing. He says, I am not only the high I'm priest, but I am a king as well. So they had to put a crown of thorns. They were mocking him, and they gave him a staff, and they were hitting him. But they had to put a crown over his head because he is switching from from not just high priestly hood, but kingship. And there's never there was never such thing before. Before there was kings and there were priests. At this moment, because of the blood of the lamb, because God is uniting all things in His perfect timing, He's bringing this thing together. So He has He's a king, but He also has a mantle. Now you know they put Him up on the cross. And they took the mantle, and the and the and the and the and the, and the, uh, the men who were mocking him, they, they said, "Hey, this is worth a lot. This is worth a lot. Let's rip it up. Let's rip it up." If they would have ripped it, he would have been demoted. At this point, he's on the cross. He can't even protect his mantle. And God used uh, greed. God used greed and greedy men to say, "No, no, no. Let's not rip it. Let's go ahead and cast lots to see if we can get it." 
God is so amazing that he wasn't worried about evil men holding on to the mantle that could have demoted Messiah because he knew, I will use greed, I will use gambling to do my will. That God is so amazing, he will use whatever he can, however he wants to, to bring the glory onto himself. And he's doing all of this in his perfect time as he begins to look at the festivals of the Lord, one after another, you don't miss a thing. 